So first of all, hello everyone. My name is Shannon. I'm a naturalist here at the Woodlands Nature Station. I do recognize a few names. I think you guys have joined us for webinars before, uh, but to everyone, welcome. Now, what we're gonna be discussing today is beavers. So my first question, has anybody here ever seen a beaver? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, quite a few actually. Um, five out of our 15 people here, so that is pretty excellent right there. Um, beavers are pretty common, but we often don't necessarily get a chance to get a real good look at them because they do tend to be nocturnal and crepuscular. Now, nocturnal, I'm sure a lot of you have heard that word before. It means that you're more active at night. Crepuscular may be a new word. Um, crepuscular means that you are active at dawn and dusk. So the beavers don't always wait until it's actual night to be active. They might start coming out in the early evening as well. So that is crepuscular, active in the evening and at dawn. Now, some of you have seen a beaver, but not everyone. So we're gonna go to our next slide right here. We're just gonna kind of establish what is a beaver. So I've got a picture of three different animals on the screen right here. I want you guys to take a look, to think of what you may previously know about beavers and see if you can figure out which one is a beaver. And I am going to put up a poll so you are able to actually select on this poll which animal you think is the beaver. And while this poll is going, I'm going to take care of something real quick. Arianne, you take noisy over here. I can't hear myself think. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like at this point nearly everyone has voted. What I'm going to do right now is end our poll and share the results. And it looks like most everyone did select the appropriate animal. The first one is the beaver. Now, when you look at the pictures right there, You'll notice that number three looks a little bit different than numbers one and two. You can see it has kind of a pointed nose, eyes in the front of its head, and it has a long furry tail. That right there is a river otter. So another aquatic mammal like the beaver, but not a beaver. Now number two looks quite a bit like our beaver at number one. It has a very similar face, eyes a bit more on the side of the head, a similar shape. But if you look to the back right here at its tail, you do see that it is covered in fur. Does anyone know what animal number two is? Anyone has an idea? You can type it right into the chat. Okay, so everyone has correctly identified that it is another rodent, just like the beaver, but a rodent that lives on land. This is a groundhog. So this is a groundhog. And then of course our beaver here is number one. Now, just a few basics about the beaver. They are the largest rodent native to North America. They can be on average about 50 pounds, so that's a pretty big animal. The largest one on record was actually about 104 pounds. That is a big rodent, 104 pounds. But more commonly, you're gonna see them at around 50 pounds or so. Now, right here behind me, I do have a couple mounted beavers, so you can see how big they are in comparison to me right here. They're a very, very large rodent. Now, they are also herbivores. Um, herbivores are animals that eat only plants. So these guys do not go after fish. That would be that river otter that we saw before. They eat only plant matter. 
Now the plant matter could be aquatic vegetation, things like leaves. Um, they will also go for um, branches themselves. So if you think of a tree branch, we don't really think of that as having a lot of nutrient in it, but what they do is they scrape off the outer bark. So that thin layer in a tree branch is gonna have living bark and that's where all of that nutrition is. You can kind of think of it like an ear of corn. We take off the corn husk, which would be like the very outer bark on a tree, and then you have those corn kernels in the middle, which you can eat, and then you're left with the corn cob in the center, which you'd toss away. A tree branch is very much like that. So right here, I'm going to um, lower this screen real quick. You can take a look at this. This is a beaver chew stick. So as I rotate that, can you guys see all of the little marks on there? So essentially when this was still a living branch, a beaver cut it down, they grabbed it, and then they just ate it like corn on the cob, took away all of that thin layer of inner bark to get all the nutrition from this tree right here. Okay, we'll pull up our screen again. Okay. Now, beavers are also keystone species. Now, has anyone heard this term before, keystone species? If you have, you can raise your hand. Okay, I'm seeing a couple. It looks like it is a new term for a lot of people here. Now, a keystone species is a species that directly affects all of the other species in its habitat. They are in some way kind of instrumental in the survival of many other species. So we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but their status as a keystone species is very tied into the fact that they are habitat builders. It creates new habitat that many other species can use. Okay, so I'm sure many people have heard the term busy as a beaver. Beavers are very, very busy. They live in family groups. You have a mated monogamous pair, so a mother and a father who actually stay together their entire lives. And they are going to have their, their family and they're gonna all work together to help everyone to survive. So what you're gonna do is you'll have them living in a house which they build themselves and they're going to live with their year-old babies, their two-year-old babies, and their newborn babies. Now at about one year old, that is when the beavers start to help out mom and dad with all of the building. And by the time they're two, they have learned what they need to know to be a busy beaver busy beaver builder, and then they're gonna head out on their own. So unlike a lot of other rodents, beavers really spend a lot of time with their parents growing up and learning. And it is a lot of work to learn how to build a be to be a beaver. I'm probably gonna be stumbling over my words quite a bit right here. <laughs> if you look at this picture right here, you can see a picture of a dam. So that is one of the things that beavers build. They can take a very thin, narrow little stream and they're gonna build a dam to back up all that water. They're gonna create a big, open, and much deeper little pond or lake than what existed before. This is beneficial for the beavers because they are great swimmers, but they're not super fast on land. So they would rather get to where they need to go by swimming. So if they increase the size of their pond, they increase the distance to places where they can go. And while they're swimming, they don't have to worry about any predators, things like uh, coyotes that might go after the beavers themselves, because if they're in a big pool of water, they can swim away very, very quickly. Now, there have been some studies done that have shown that ponds, when they have beavers on them, have about nine times as much water as it might contain if there were no beavers there. So they really increase the amount of water on a landscape. Now, 
once they have made a nice big pond to live in, they're also gonna need a home. They don't live in the dams. The only purpose of the dams is to back up water and create a larger open pond. What they're gonna live in are lodges. So the lodges can be built in two different ways. They might go up to the bank and they will dig into the dirt and make basically a bank lodge by digging into the side of the river or the stream or the pond. And then another way they can build a lodge is by basically making a big pile of sticks right in the middle of the pond. Now, when I first learned about lodges, I thought they must carefully construct it so they could then go in underneath, but that's not quite the case. Now, they are carefully constructed, but they will pile up a bunch of sticks, and then, they're great chewers, they will go through and chew out an opening inside of that lodge. Now, the lodge is a great place for the beavers to live and be protected because they'll have an entrance underwater so you have to actually swim to get up into the lodge. And that means that they're protected from really almost every predator out there because not a lot of predators are gonna swim into the lodge and get into that underwater entrance right there. Now, as you can see, building both the dams and the lodges requires a lot of sticks. So beavers are very good at chewing through those sticks. They will take down trees and strip all of the branches. They'll take all of that inner bark and eat that and then use the leftovers to construct their homes. So if you can imagine if you made your house out of all of your food leftovers. So that's basically what the beavers are doing. Now if you're curious about how quickly a beaver can take down a tree, if you guys find a ruler and you take a look at six inches, so a, a tree that is about six inches across, it will take them about an hour to cut through that tree. So six inches across, about an hour. So I think that is pretty impressive, just using their teeth. Okay. So beavers have to do a lot of things to survive. They really construct some really big elaborate habitats of all of the animals. There's really only one more that changes habitats more so than a beaver. Now, can anyone guess what animal alters their habitat more than a beaver does? There's only one. Okay, now this might be a little bit of a trick question because, he, because we don't often think of this species as an animal, but we are one. It is humans. The only thing that changes habitats more than a beaver does are people. So that's pretty amazing. Beavers really do a lot. Now, in order to do that, to make those changes to, the, to, the, to an ecosystem, they do have a lot of specialized adaptations. Now an adaptation is a unique feature or trait that allows an animal to do what they need to do to survive. Now, for example, with a human, we do have some special adaptations, one of which is our opposable thumbs. So the fact that we can turn our thumb like this means that we can pick up things much more easily than if we could not turn our thumb that way. So we'd still be able to grab things that way, but if we couldn't turn our thumb, it'd be a lot harder for us to do some of the things that we do as humans, such as using tools. So that is a human adaptation, that opposable thumb right there. Now, right now, I want you guys to think about the beavers, think about where they live. They are a large, aquatic rodent, think about what they need to do. They need to be able to raise their young. They need to be able to eat a variety of plants and tree bark. They need to be able to swim and build lodges and dams. 
So can you guys think of any adaptations, any special features that you think would be useful for a beaver to have? You can think of any, just type it right there into the chat. Okay, I'm seeing some good suggestions in here. Okay, I see a lot of great suggestions right here. Now, I think what we're going to do is try to illustrate exactly what those adaptations are. And for that, I do need an assistant. So I have asked one of my coworkers, Arianne, to help me out with this. So what we're going to do next is we're going to take a lot of these suggestions right here, and we are going to turn her into a beaver by trying to add on some of those specialized beaver adaptations. Hang on. You told me that I'd be helping with your presentation. You are. You are. <laughs> okay. Let's get her up on the screen right here. Now, I am going to move the computer real quick. Just in case, you know, moving screens bothers anyone there. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we need to turn Ariane into a beaver. Now, I saw a lot of great suggestions right here. Um, we are going to start with one, which is a layer of fat. Oh, yeah. So this is going to be her layer of fat. So we're going to put that on Ariane right here. Now, the fat layer is to help insulate the beaver. Now, beavers are active all throughout the year. They do not hibernate. So they can be out swimming in the cold water in the middle of winter. So a nice thick layer of fat is going to help them to stay nice and warm. Now, I also saw someone on here said thick fur, and that is another important adaptation for the beavers. Okay. <laughs> so oh, we wonderful. are going to add some thick fur here for Ariane. Okay. Okay. Now, to help you guys understand exactly how thick a beaver's fur is, we're going to talk about how many hairs per square inch they have. Now, so imagine a square inch, so a little square, an inch wide on all sides right there. Inside that one inch square, a beaver has about 100,000 hairs. Now, for some perspective on what that means, on our head as humans, we have about 1,000 hairs per square inch. The beaver, 100,000 humans. 1,000. Your average dog has about 60,000. So if you can imagine how much thicker a dog's fur is compared to our human head, think about how much thicker that beaver fur is. Now that nice thick fur is going to help them to swim around and stay nice and warm. It also offers a bit of protection because when your fur is that thick, if a predator were to take a swipe at you, it'd be really hard to get through all of this really, really thick fur. So that is an important adaptation. Okay, now. I am warm. <laughs> Another thing that goes along with the fur is oil. So we're gonna give her some WD-40 right here. Now WD-40 is not the oil that a beaver would use they would use a uh, castor oil, a uh, castor gland that will help them. It's basically a gland at the base of their tail that helps make oil. They would then spread all over their fur. Okay, now, <laughs> exactly, yes. They spread it all over there to keep themselves nice and waterproof. Don't use that, that will hurt people. Oh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use it. <laughs> Just yeah, it's just for here. demonstration. Now, another adaptation I saw someone mention right here was claws. And for that, we do need to give Ariane some beaver feet. Now, with beavers, their front feet 
<laughs> I haven't seen this in a very long time. So with beavers, their front feet are going to be used for digging into the ground. So those bank lodges, they would be able to dig right into the soil. They also will dig up mud and use that when they're constructing their dams and their lodges to help kind of seal up any holes. And their, their feet are actually very hand-like. They don't have any webbing or anything because they use their front feet to carry things. When they're swimming, they actually swim by kind of tucking their hands up to their chest and using only their back feet. So no special adaptations on the front feet for swimming, but the back feet do have some adaptations. So the back feet are much more like paddles. They have webbing on the toes and they would use them to kind of paddle very quickly through the water. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Okay. okay, so we've go. got our webbed back feet, non-webbed clawed front feet, and I'd say we've got our feet ready to go on our new beaver right here. Now, there are some other adaptations we need. So as they're swimming through the water, can you guys keep your eyes open when you're swimming? I know some people can, I have never been able to do that. I always need to have something covering my eyes. Beavers have an eye covering built in. It's called a nictating membrane. And so it's basically like an extra clear eyelid that just covers up their eyes. So we need some eye covering for Ariane right here if we're going to have her be a beaver. So cover her eyes right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, another thing they do have are special ear flaps. If, has anyone been swimming and gotten water in your ear? You kind of have to try to shake it out and everything. Not very comfortable. Beavers also don't want to have water in their ears, but unlike us, they have special ear flaps and they will basically close their ears up while they're swimming. Very, very useful. So let's give Ariane some ear flaps. I have a hard time with, with uh, ear muffs here. They always like start spinning on me. There we go. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we've got her ear flaps covered right there. Now, another thing that they do need, which I saw a lot of people mention, is specialized teeth. Uh, beavers have really amazing teeth. As a rodent, their teeth grow their entire lives. Every time they close their teeth, they kind of come together like a pair of scissors and they sharpen themselves. So their teeth are always sharp, always ready to cut down a tree, and they actually have iron in their enamel that adds extra strength to them. So that iron does turn their teeth orange, but it makes them very strong. So real quick, here is a beaver skull. Now, unfortunately, we've had this for many, many years, so its teeth have gotten a little bit broken over the years, but you can see that bright orange color right there. And then if we tip it up, you can see these, these lines right here. That is where the muscles attach to the skull. They have very, very strong muscles that will help them to chew right through those trees. So remember, a six inch tree in about an hour. So we need some orange teeth for Ariane. My mother will be so proud. <laughs> Okay. There uh, we go. Yeah. We've got some orange teeth for her. Now the teeth are basically outside of her lips, but that is appropriate. A beaver is actually able to close their lips behind their teeth, have their leaf their teeth sticking out while their mouth is closed. That way they can chew on things underwater and not have water rushing into their mouth. Okay, now real quick if my beaver can turn. And we will see 
that we do have a beaver tail. So beaver tails are very large and very thick, and they do have some special adaptations here. A beaver's tail helps them to do a number of different things. One thing is it acts as a rudder when they're swimming. So when those back feet are paddling along, it can turn their tail to help them to turn in different directions, just like a rudder on a boat. Another thing is if they're on land and chewing at a tree, they can actually use this tail kind of like a kickstand to help them lean back as they're chewing and prop themselves up. Now, another thing that this tail does is they're really big and they actually have a lot of fat in them. And that fat will help them if they go through a lean time. They can live off of a bit of the stored fat in their tail. Now, another thing that they have these guys are also going to use this tail to slap at the water. So they slap the water, and that is a way that they can notify the other beavers in the area if there is danger nearby. Remember, they live in family groups, so they are going to want to let each other know if there is something around. Okay. Now, we have one other thing. Beavers have excellent lungs because they can actually stay underwater for about 15 minutes. Okay, so Ariane, what we need you to do is to hold your breath for 15 minutes. You'll never know because I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, humans really can't do that, but these guys are able to. Okay. <laughs> yes, we, we are not going to be able to hold our breath for 15 minutes as a human. Another cool thing, if everyone takes a big deep breath, as humans, we're able to, to change out about 15% of the air in our lungs. If a beaver were to take a really big deep breath, they can actually get 75% of their lungs full of new air. So this means after they've been swimming around for 15 minutes underwater, they can come up, big deep breath, and all of a sudden their lung is almost entirely full of new fresh air. So that is a great adaptation that is gonna help you swim for a long time underwater. Okay, so here is our complete fever. We have clawed front feet, webbed back feet. We have a large tail that is used for many different things, including swimming and propping themselves up as they chew down those trees. We have the nictitating membranes over the eyes to allow them to swim more easily. We have flaps over the ears to help close off those ears while they're in the water. And of course we have these very large front teeth that have iron in the enamel to make them nice and strong and allow them to cut down trees very, very quickly. So a lot of great adaptations. So thank you very much to our beaver right here. Now shovel away. <laughs> okay. Okay, so a lot of really amazing adaptations right there. Okay, now we're going to go back to what all of those great adaptations allow the beavers to do, which is to be a keystone species, which is to create habitat for a large number of other animals. Now for this one, I do have another poll. So let's pull that one up right here. And now the question is that the beaver dams they, and lodges, they create habitat that many other species can use. So if this is multiple choice, you can choose as many species as you like, which species you think benefit from having beavers around.
Okay, it looks like almost everyone has voted at this point. Okay, and I see uh, one question has come up right here. Uh, what is a waterfowl? So waterfowl are things like ducks and geese and egrets. They are birds that live in the water. Okay, it looks like almost everyone has answered right here. So let's take a look at our results. Okay. So it looks like somebody picked each of them and that is correct. All of these animals benefit from beavers. So you have dragonflies, the dragonfly nymphs actually grow up in the water and a lot of them like the nice still ponds that beavers correct, create. You have fish. A lot of different fish species are going to live in a beaver pond. It's actually been found that beaver ponds increase the number of things like salmon and trout. Frogs. Frogs are going to live in a beaver pond. Turtles. Woodpeckers. Uh, woodpeckers are not a bird that live in the water, but they still benefit from beaver ponds. When a beaver uh, floods an area, it will kill a lot of trees. Now, when trees die, that's just the start of their life, really, because a dead tree provides habitat to lots and lots of different animals, including woodpeckers. So they will be able to ex excavate holes in those dead trees. The waterfowl, things like ducks and geese, are going to benefit from beaver ponds. Deer, deer will actually go hang out near beaver ponds. They'll be able to drink the water. They can eat a lot of the aquatic vegetation that grows in there. And then we have otters. Otters also benefit from beaver ponds. They'll be able to swim around in there and catch a lot of fish. Now remember when I mentioned that beaver ponds increase the, num of the amount of water on a landscape? It's been found that in times of drought, sometimes the only place that you might have water is in a beaver pond. It's basically a way to help increase the amount of water on a land, on a landscape, and that benefits all animals. When water is scarce, to be able to have a water source somewhere, that is going to be beneficial. Now we're going to real quick meet a few of these animals that do benefit. So we'll start. With a turtle right here. So this right here is a painted turtle. So you can see all of the bright colors. That is where the painted turtles get their name because they're so brightly colored. It looks as though they've been painted. So turtles are going to really enjoy living in a landscape that's been modified by beavers because of all of that open still water, a great place for them to swim around. Now turtles tend to be very omnivorous. They're going to eat both plants and animals. So in that beaver pond, if you have an increased amount of aquatic insects, things like dragonflies and dragonfly nymphs are going to benefit from that water. The turtles will then be able to come along and eat those aquatic insects. They're also going to eat the pond plants that are able to grow. And then all of the trees that have been knocked down are also helpful for a turtle. Any guesses how a turtle would use a fallen over tree? So turtles are cold-blooded. They're as warm as their environment. In order to warm themselves up, what they will do is actually climb up out of the water and basically just bask in the sun. So those different logs that have been knocked over and are hanging around in the water, you can sometimes get a whole row of turtles just all sitting on the log. Yeah, basically trying to get a suntan. They don't really tan, but they do get nice and warm from it. Okay, 
I had a few questions right here about this turtle. One was, is he alive? He is alive. He's just very, very calm. So he lives here with us because uh, he was found by some people and kept as a pet. And he was kept for so long that he couldn't go back into the wild. And he actually didn't get fed the right kinds of food. He actually got fed way too much meat. And that caused his shell to grow in an unusual way. You can kind of see how he's got kind of a weird dent right here and it curves upwards. It used to be much more noticeable. Um, turtles should have kind of more of a smooth domed shell rather than a wavy one. So a few years of living here with us, he's starting to get more of a normal shape to his shell. Is, are his colors natural? They are natural. Um, this is what color a painted turtle is. Um, some of them can be even brighter than this. They're one of the prettier turtles out there, I think. Okay. Okay, I see a question, how old is he? I don't know his exact age. Um, he is probably around eight or so though. He's been with us for about four years and um, he was relatively small when he came to us. So he probably wasn't, you know, much more than three or four years at that time. And he does not yet have a name. We occasionally have naming contests for some of our animals, but we have yet to have one for him. So maybe we'll need to do that. Okay. Now, next animal I am going to leave inside of his carrier because he's a little bit harder to manage, and that is our bullfrog. So frogs are one of those animals that do benefit from a beaver pond. So a bullfrog like this would live in there as an adult, swimming around eating all of the aquatic insects that were drawn to the, that water. And they also really rely on it when they're babies. So does a, a bullfrog look like this when he's a baby? Not at all. Yes, they go through metamorphosis, which means they are laid as eggs. Then those eggs are going to hatch out and they are going to be tadpoles. So basically tadpole, just a long tail, no feet or anything. They have to go through the metamorphosis process in order to grow the legs and become the adult frog that we have right here. So a nice still beaver pond is an ideal place for baby frogs to grow up. Okay. Okay. Now, next up, we're going to take a look at one more animal that does benefit from beaver ponds. And then I see that we do have a fair number of questions right here. So I will answer those questions in just a moment. Okay, so I feel like I've been using Jeff Beck here for a lot of my programs, but with a beaver program, ducks really benefit from beaver ponds. So especially wood ducks. Remember when I mentioned that the beaver ponds might flood an area and kill some trees? So wood ducks, like woodpeckers, are going to make their nest in a tree cavity. So a dead tree is a great thing for them because it gives them a place to lay their eggs and begin raising their young. And then if you do have wood ducks, after one day, they're gonna be leaving that nest cavity. And if they're in a flooded area where there's water right below, that is really beneficial because they can drop right down into the water and they can begin swimming around, following after mom and looking for food. These guys are also omnivores, which means they're going to benefit from the different plants that grow in a beaver pond, as well as from all of the aquatic insects that are going to make their home in there. They can eat all of that and then grow up to be an adult duck, just like Woodrow right here. Okay, I see a question right there. Do wood ducks fly south for the winter? They typically don't. They're usually here year-round. So they're going to be here all winter long. 
And beaver ponds can be beneficial as well as you go further north. Um, in some areas, when you have a beaver pond, it actually freezes later and thaws earlier because they have so much more water in that area. Okay, is it a boy or a girl and does he have a name? Uh, this is a boy. Um, his name is Woodrow Darling. Um, most often though, we call him Duck Duck. It just kind of stuck. <laughs> So wood duck's just one of the different types of waterfowl that will benefit from having a beaver pond nearby. Okay, I'm gonna put him away real quick. So Woodrow loves playing in his water. He is always wet. <laughs> kind of dry off my hands before I touch the computer again. Okay. So I see we do have some questions up here. So I'm gonna go through and see some of these right here. Um, so our first one is, can the beavers swim for longer than 15 minutes? They can. Um, I have actually, in all my research about beavers, I never found like a limit for the amount of time they can swim. Um, the 15 minutes is just how long they can swim straight underwater without surfacing. They do spend their day pretty much all day swimming around in, in the, uh, the pond right there. And I don't know at what point they would become tired. I have to imagine, you know, everything gets tired at some point, but the beavers are able to just keep swimming around and they'll go and rest during the day, come back out at night. Okay, do we have many beavers here at Lamington Lakes? We do, beavers are pretty common here. Some of the better places to see them include Long Creek, which is uh, very close to the nature station. It's one of our trails. Uh, there is also Honker Trail. Um, Honker Lake has a lot of beavers on it, as does Energy Lake. Now, because the beavers are nocturnal and crepuscular, it has to be, you know, pretty close to dark to see a beaver. So we don't see them all the time, but they are there and they leave signs behind. So some of the most obvious signs are dams and lodges. So those big, large constructions there are pretty hard to miss if you come across one but they'll also do some more subtle signs. Uh, one of those is they will actually take, scoop up mud and muck, muck from the bottom of the pond and pile it up on the bank. And then on top of that pile, they will actually leave their scent. And that is basically a signpost to other beavers who can smell the smell and they know that this is an occupied territory. So there's no room for them to live right there. So they will basically Tell everyone I live here and leave their scent in a big pile of mud right there. Okay. Question, would birds move more than humans? That's a good question right there and I think it might depend on the situation. Now in terms of, especially some of the migratory birds, in terms of how far they migrate, I would say in their lifetime, they move a lot more than humans do. Things like, you know, the ruddy turnstone moving hundreds of thousands of miles each time they migrate. Um, and then there's other times if you come across something like an owl sitting in a tree, they just sit using their camouflage and hardly move at all. So it really depends on the situation for the birds, I think. How about Freddy for the turtle? Could be a good one right there. And what is the frog's name? He also does not have a name. Um, he is right now just the bullfrog. Where are his legs? I'm assuming is this, uh, if this is in re reference to the frog, I kept him facing so that his, his face was facing us. He was basically all stretched out. His front feet were kind of under him and then his back feet were stretched out behind him. But he does have very large back legs. They are great jumpers. They can jump, I believe a bullfrog can in one jump go over 10 feet. So that is quite a big jump right there and those big strong legs allow them to do that. 
So that is one of their adaptations. Okay, what is a beaver's lifespan? That is a great question there. It is around 15 years or so. So they are relatively long lived, especially when compared to other types of rodents. Okay, how many dams can a beaver build in a lifetime? That is a great question right there. And I don't know. Um, yeah, they, they can build a lot, and I don't know quite where to look to find the right answer. Now, the exact number of dams a beaver does build in their territory really depends on the territory itself. What happens is the sound of running water seems to get a beaver to start building a dam. So if they had basically a real simple stream, they need to build one dam, and that stopped the water from running they'd probably stop building dams at that point. But if it was more complex and there was more water running in, if the water um, burst over uh, the bank in a new location, they'd hear that running water and they'd go build a dam there. So it's really no limit to the number of dams they will build in their habitat. Just wherever water is running, the beaver will try to dam it up. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna real quick glance at our Q&A here and our chat. Oh, so I see a question here um, that I had missed earlier about our skull. So we do, if we find animals that have died, we are able to take different parts and use them as props to help people learn a little bit more about them. So no, we don't kill any animals here, but we do try to make use of different things so that we can help teach people more about them. And that's the same for these, these mounts right here. They were donated to us. Uh, sometimes people will like inherit um, animal mounts and they usually have no idea what to do with them. So they will often come to the nature station and ask us if we would like them. And if we can use them to help teach people, then we will do so. Oh, and I see another great point right here. Um, that not just humans have opposable thumbs. That's true. Adaptations aren't always unique to one species. Sometimes they are, but something that works, you often see that in multiple species in the animal world. So opposable thumbs, you do see in primates as well. So uh, chimpanzees and other monkeys, they also have those opposable thumbs. You can imagine for them, climbing trees and things, having opposable thumbs, very, very useful feature. Okay. Oh, another great question. How many babies can a beaver have? They might have approximately three to five each litter. And they do have a litter of babies every year. And they stay with their parents until they're about two years old. And they're going to, first they're gonna help out raising their younger siblings. They'll bring them food and they will help to clear out their bedding. And then they're going to move on to helping construct and repair the dams and lodges. So after they've learned how to do all of those things at about two years old, then they're gonna head out on their own. Now, they might travel only a few miles away and start their own area, but sometimes they can travel much further if they just can't find a nice open area where they can create their own beaver pond. Okay. Okay, guys. So I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about this important keystone species. Beavers and their construction has a very big impact on the habitat on, and on all kinds of other animals that can benefit from their habitat and from the increased amount of water on the landscape. And uh, basically building a new beaver and turning Ariane here into a beaver. I think we gave her some of those features, but I'm not sure how good she'd do if we asked her to cut down a tree. Okay, I want to thank everyone for coming and joining us here. And at this point, um, does anyone have any final questions? Let's see. Um, how fast can a beaver swim? That is a great question. I feel like I've seen 
about 15 miles an hour, but I'll be honest, I can't remember the exact number. So I will have to go look that up again to be certain. So I can't give you an answer that I'm certain on right there. They are much faster in the water than they are compared to being on land. They try to stay in the water as much as they can. Um, how can a beaver swim? So they have those webbed back feet. And what they're gonna do is, they really don't use the front feet, they just tuck the front feet in, and then those webbed back feet start paddling along. And when you look at a beaver, they're just kind of round. So that round shape is basically able to slide through the water very easily, and then to switch direction, they just turn their tail, and that will help them to turn very, very quickly. Okay. See some more questions may have popped up over here. Oh, the duck's legs. Where is the duck's legs? I must have been holding him just below the camera. He was standing up on them, but he might have, they might have been just out of view there. Um, the duck does have something in common with the beaver. Remember, I mentioned that sometimes an adaptation is found across different species. Ducks, just like beavers, have webbed feet. How long is a beaver? Um, it depends on how old that beaver is. I'd say on average, a beaver from nose to the base of the tail, not including the tail itself, is around two feet or so. So, two of these. Okay, guys, does anyone have any last questions? Now, it looks like we have been in this webinar for 55 minutes now. So in the time it would take a beaver to cut down a six inch tree, we have hopefully learned just a little bit more about this keystone species. So thank you all so much for coming out and learning about beavers with me. I hope you all have a good rest of your day.